Please rise for the procession of the cross. and the truth is not in us. Let's take a moment and reflect silently on God's word and examine ourselves.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you shine the light of Christ into our world of darkness, division, and death. Grant that we may know Christ, the light of the world. Walk in his light all the days of our lives, and by your grace, be delivered as one people into the place of eternal light and life at the end of all days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. 
So now present your members of flame in righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruits were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. These are the words of life. Thanks be to God. Please rise.
words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and redeemer. A question that faces us this morning is, do you want what you have coming? Justice is a hot issue in our modern society. We take a look at celebrity trials like Kyle Rittenhouse and the Johnny Depp Amber Heard thing and wonder if the courts can really deliver justice. Each of us has our own opinions about what is just and what is right, and we may be right, and again, we may be wrong. But justice, it seems, is hard to find. As we watch current events unfold, we all want to see people get what they've got coming, whether it is good for them or bad. Because we can no longer rely on the news media to report honestly or impartially. And we are never sure what is true and fair, what is just or not, or something that is just an opinion. When it comes to personal issues, though, we would like to see justice. That is, we would like to see what we've got coming. We want a fair wage. We want equal treatment before the law, and we want stuff like that. Not only do we want it for ourselves, but generally we want it for everybody else as well. Some people want special privileges, but most of us would be quite content in just getting what we've got coming. Paul is describing the gospel in our epistle lesson this morning. He has been writing about obedience. In the previous versions of Romans, we see in our text that in part he is describing an urgency of holy living, of putting away sin and fighting temptation, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, we know he seems to use the word obedience in a couple of different ways. On one hand, we know that the word obedience seems to be modifying behavior and conforming one's life to God, the law of God. And the other one, apparently, means faith, to have faith. The word obedience itself is used in more than one sentence in the same passage. It can be confusing. And even though it's confusing, the epistle lesson this morning is an attempt to clarify these things and goes well with our theme of the morning, which is, do you want what you've got coming? Now, if you ask this question to Christians, they're going to say, yes, of course I want what I've got coming. They want what they have coming because they have eternal life in store for them. Eternal life with Jesus, a life of joy, a life of peace and glory through Jesus Christ. But that's not what I mean when I ask the question, do you want what you got coming? Do you want what you really deserve? And as a Christian, we would say, no, we don't, because if you look at it, what we deserve is hell and damnation and death. No, we don't want what we've got coming in the sense of what we have earned in by our own sins. Well, that real realization is what Paul is meant to tell us by the way of talking about obedience and slavery and the like. The first step in understanding the passage which Paul writes is he seems to be speaking in terms of human weakness, the weakness we have in our flesh. He means to say, be alert. He is saying it does not necessarily sound like what you might have heard. You have to pay attention and think about it too. He is using the closest human analogy that comes with us to illustrate or to explain the truth of the gospel. What he says, even in analogy, is true, but it's real in reality, the deeper meaning is much deeper than you can give with an analogy. One should also keep in mind that we have jumped in here, as it were, 
in the middle of this discussion of obedience, sin, and forgiveness. We're not starting at the beginning. The apostle writes that the freedom in this world is never absolute, and how our slavery to sin is more complete and deeper and thorough going as far as we can imagine. It is true in part because no one in this world can control the heart or the mind of a slave. You can force them to obey. You can force them to do things that they don't want to do. You can tell them do this and do that, but you cannot make them love or admire you or your cause. A slave may choose to do that and might even do it with a terrorist-like zealousness for your cause, but that's their decision, not your work. Even brainwashing doesn't work until the victim cooperates by choice. It may be a horrible and extreme choice, perhaps, but it is a choice nonetheless. Hypnosis even requires a willing subject to really work. These things are true because we are insulated and actually quite alone inside our own heads. No man or woman can make another his absolute slave without their cooperation. Sin is another matter, though. We are all corrupt. Sin has become entangled and intertwined in our very nature since the fall. If we use a farming analogy, the original breeding stock came to us corrupted, and so all of their offspring came that carry that same corruption of sin. You and I are twisted by nature. We're not the creatures that we were supposed to be. Sin turns us from looking to God and caring about others as we were created to do, and sin turns us into creatures that are only concerned about what's in it for them and what does it mean for me. We no longer look to God because we don't want to be under his boot. We don't want to be uh, a slave to God. We would rather be a slave to ourselves. And the one individual who pulls our strings in this twisted condition is the father of evil, the devil himself. We are absolutely his slaves. Slaves of sin. We no longer possess the capability by nature to think without sin, to speak without sin, or to act with proper motives. Worse than that, when our sin calls, our very nature jumps to serve. We want to do it. We feel cheated when we hold ourselves back from it, let alone let alone when someone else prevents us from doing it. You know the feeling from your own experiences. News about a terrorist and kidnapping and murders, they proliferate throughout the news media. And they illustrate for us how we, as humans, can do hideous things to others by simply because they are not us. They are not me. The evil to which we are enslaved by nature earns us death, as Paul writes. Therefore, what benefit were you when deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of these things is death. Now Paul is not writing about physical death. Paul is writing about the eternal death. He means to put the reader in mind that death is not merely the cessation of an existence, but it is the beginning of torments of the damned. The outcome of sin is death, for the wages of sin is death. That is what sin earns, merits, deserves, 
and receives without faith. Which where the gospel comes in for you and I. Our sin receives the sentence of death too. But there's a difference. Ours has already been carried out, but not on us. Jesus bore that sentence on the cross. He died. His death is what we have earned. He endured the very torments of hell on the cross and in his passion. And because Jesus died for our sins, you and I have been redeemed. And by raising Jesus from death, God the Father has declared you and I forgiven. He has erased our sins from our accounts. We are no longer sinners, but saints. The Word of God gives us the gift of grace, which is forgiveness of all sins. Paul is trying to make clear what the gospel does and what it means for a Christian in this life. When he writes that you were a slave of sin, you were entirely free in regards to righteousness. You couldn't choose it. You couldn't do it. It had no appeal to you. And even if you did the same thing as a righteous man did in righteousness, your works were looked on as evil and sinful because they flowed from a sinful heart. The good tree produces good fruit. The evil tree produces evil fruit. The, e the good tree cannot produce evil fruit, and the evil tree cannot produce good fruit. You and I were, and most of mankind is still today, slaves of sin. But now Jesus has redeemed us by his death on the cross and claimed us in the washing of baptism. And he has adopted us into our family. Even so, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. He who has died is free from sin, and you and I have all died with Christ in our baptism. As Romans 6, 4 promises and commands, sin shall not be the master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So you and I are freed by Christ from sin. Now you have become a slave of righteousness. If you are dead to sin, you cannot live in it any longer. Since you live in this new life by the power of the Holy Spirit, you must humble yourself to be guided by that Holy Spirit. Jesus is now your master, and you are at the same time his brother and his slave. But since the outcome of this slavery is life everlasting and righteousness, Paul expects that you will agree that the result sounds pretty good. And this slavery to righteousness is also deeper and more thoroughgoing than you realize. We cannot feel this slavery in its truth and fullness because we still wear the queasling flesh. We still wear that flesh that is prone to evil. Your flesh is still hungry for sin and evil, yet you are now a holy servant of God. Your will is shaped like his will. He shaped it, not you. You cannot feel the shaping of your will, but it is at work in you. The outcomes of this new slavery is your sanctification. You can actually see it as your life moves easily that you can feel it in your own consciousness. God is at work in you, bringing your life and conduct into conformity with his will. The task is never complete while we wear the sinful flesh. But it is happening, and at the end, the outcome of all this work 
by God is eternal life for you and me. Now Paul encourages us, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness resulting in sanctification. In other words, if you're going to be a slave either way, choose to be deliberately God's slave while you have the power, his power in you to make that choice. Be deliberately Christian. Think about what you do. Think about what you say. Even when you allow your mind to go and serve the one who rewards and the wages of what you want to receive. Live out the reality which he, Paul, is telling you about. Of course, we want to remember that while death is earned, eternal life is a free gift given to those who do not deserve it for the sake of Jesus Christ. Your service to Christ doesn't even earn you a thing before God. Jesus said, so you too, when you have all the things which are commanded to you, say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done that which is only we ought to have done. They are not even your works. Actually, it is the Holy Spirit working through you. And yet God still credits you with them and saves you by his grace because those who are his slaves have been selected by him to receive the free gift of life everlasting. I don't know about you, but I want life eternal. I'm sure you do too. My flesh wants to sin, and in fact, it is still enslaved to sin. But I want to go to heaven. And so I discipline my body, and I apply the one thing God has given me to conform and to combat sin in my life, and that is his gospel. I apply it by hearing his word. I apply it by remembering my baptism. I apply it by receiving the body and blood of my Lord Jesus Christ, taking it as it is sometimes called the medicine of immortality. I apply it by reading the word of God daily. I apply the gospel in my life and in my dealings with others. I encourage others to work with Christ, to work with the Holy Spirit, and no longer be slaves to sin. Since we are slaves either way, we can surrender the notions of what I deserve or what my rights are and choose to live more for Christ. We can suffer insults and discouragements for him. We can stand alone if needs we need to. We can call on his truth and holding his banner high, we welcome all who are his and invite the slaves of our enemy to join us in Christ's saving service. We make that invitation by speaking God's powerful word to them. We want to do this. But even that desire is the power of God in each and every one of us. It's not by your own free will. Even the good we do, we are slaves cheerfully and gladly, but we are slaves nonetheless. A slave to righteousness and sanctification, a slave of God. And in the end, we do not get what we deserve. We don't get what we've got coming. But instead, we receive the gift of grace and salvation, which is both wonderful and undeserved by you and I. So now that you've had time to think about it and heard my explanation, question remains, do you want what you've got coming? I don't. I want the gift of God in Christ Jesus instead. 
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise. And let us confess our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we worship God with our tithes and offerings. Thank you. God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, your Son fulfilled all righteousness and submitted to baptism with sinners in the Jordan. Well pleased, you opened the heavens for us and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. As you have joined us to Christ's death and resurrection by holy baptism, and have given us your Spirit, strengthen our hearts and open our ears to hear your holy word, and to rejoice that you have made us your beloved children in him. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, as you have opened heaven to your church through holy baptism, give her faithful teachers to proclaim your son, Jesus Christ, and all that affords to godliness, that many would repent of their sins and join him in his kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, your son, Jesus, is the Christ and the true king of this world. Grant great humility to the rulers of the nations, that they would submit to the preaching of his holy word for the sake of their own souls and for the good of your holy people. Lord, in your mercy. O oh God, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, have compassion on your creation. 
Deliver from all danger those who are threatened by natural disaster, dangerous weather, war, pestilence, flood, or famine. Provide all that is needed for this body and life. Lord, in your mercy, you sent your son as the servant who preserved the bruised reed and the faintly burning wick. Hear us on behalf of those in need in healing and deliverance. Especially we uphold to you, Betty Romero, Vern Lake, Lila Griggers, Jason Palmer, Rosa Sanchez, Jim Brown, Lee Makowitz, Lori Brody, Marty Brody, Doris Inouye, Alel de Guzman, and John Havens. Provide healing, restoration, and justice according to your good and gracious will. And grant that we would always rejoice in your son's everlasting faithfulness towards us. Lord, in your mercy. O oh God, in baptism we were buried with Christ into death and raised with him to walk in the newness of life. As we partake of Holy Communion today, give us repentant hearts to receive Jesus' body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. Lord, in your mercy. We praise you, Lord, for Jacob Sanchez, Jorge Contreras, and Aaron Moreno this week of their birthdays. Holy Spirit, we praise you for Joe Garcia and Alex Zavala celebrating this week rebirth and adoption into your family and church by your holy baptism. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you have called your church from every tribe and nation. Grant that your people throughout the world would rejoice in the death and resurrection of Christ and live of those who have died and risen with him in holy baptism. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times...
over in the kitchen, followed by a Bible study in the um, old chapel. Um, we're thankful for God that uh, John got out of the hospital, so we praise uh, God for that. We also uh, uh, thank God for uh, travel mercies that AJ is now up in Washington State. So, how's she doing? She's doing good. Awesome. Good to hear. So we praise God and we ask God for uh, his blessings upon her during her internship. Uh, any other announcements or bits of wisdom? Go in peace and have a blessed week.